All right. Yay. All right. Bailey got to figure it out. Good. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to week three. Uh, uh, well, it, it is what it is, right? Um, hope, hopefully live classes will start again on the 15th. Uh, we'll just kind of see what happens. Okay. Right now it's all kind of up in the air. Uh, all right. Business as usual, starting with that. First of all, I I've graded everybody, all the assignments that have been turned in for the last week, last Thursday, explaining the Constitution. And I have to say, you know, first of all, I was incredibly impressed with those that did the work. Uh, this is a complex document. It's really not that long, but I saw people, I had one person turn me in an 11 page essay on this thing. Like that's a little bit bit over the top. Okay, a lot over the top. But still, uh, I love that you dug into it and really figured out what this document really says. It's the nuts and bolts of how the government is supposed to work. This is the supreme law of the land. That's what the Supreme Court calls it. That's what it is. No law can be established that doesn't agree with the Constitution. But at this point, at what we're looking at, it doesn't have the Bill of Rights. It says nothing about the rights of its citizens that are protected by the government. Rights the government can't take away. We'll talk about that a little bit later. OK, uh, the other thing I was really disturbed by uh, and, and kind of moved by was the fact that about half of the people just didn't do the work yet. Um, that is not going to be a working formula. OK, uh, I will give I do give you an extra week. So you have until this Thursday at noon to get that first homework in. After that, I'll be glad to take the work, but the zero is going to stay. OK, so the winning formula is just get it done. OK, I would rather have you do something rather than nothing. I cannot reward you for doing nothing. OK, I just can't. And that's not not how this is going to be. So if you haven't got it done, do that literally today. OK, you know, you need to do it just to do it. There's there's I get a lot of students that either get stuck in this rut of falling behind or are too obsessed with doing perfect work rather than just doing the work. Um, your employers don't care if your work is perfect. They care if it's done. It can always be made better. OK, so get it done. So that's last week. Uh, and we, we looked at most of the early colonies. We're, we're going to finish that up today. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. I do want to remind you that this week you have your homework three that is due Thursday by noon. That's the write your own constitution. I got a couple of emails about this one. This needs to be fictional. OK, so make up your own country. All right. Let's say, you know, uh, I, I love Nebbia's last name. So let's say this would be like Pain Town or something. I, yeah, whatever, okay? Call it whatever you want. I don't care. But I do want you to take this seriously. And you need to create a functioning, a document that creates a functioning government. You cannot copy the Constitution, but you can take ideas from it, okay? So in other words, this is, the, the word I really love here is aspirational. If you could make a better document, a better world based on a better document, what would that look like? And here's really where I think the most important lesson here, one of the best ones for today and for moving forward is that it is always easy to complain. It's much more challenging to solve the problem, right? It's easy to point out our politicians and say, you can do better, but how can you do this better? Um, Sarah, I would like to, yes, but I don't want you to get, to get bogged down in what we see in the Bill of Rights, okay? If you want to talk about generic ideas like every citizen has equal rights, period, yeah. But let's not get bogged down in these, you know, Second Amendment fights, First Amendment fights, all that stuff. That's for another day. And, and we do have another assignment that will deal with that okay so we'll, we'll deal with the bill of rights but broad things focus more on the purpose of the constitution itself to create a functioning government okay all right good good questions all right so let's boogie today any questions on any of that stuff on on what we've already done or what you got coming up uh this coming week Whoopsie, there we go. Okay, uh, you know, uh, I'm available 
I got office hours, uh, uh, email, whatever. If you've got any questions, I am here to help you succeed. You just got to ask. Okay. So um, last week, we, we looked at a lot of the early colonies. We're not going to spend our time looking at all 13 of the original colonies. We're really looking at, at the kind of unique and pivotal ones. So we start with Jamestown, with, with what becomes Virginia, okay? Then we looked at Massachusetts Bay, and, and that's where we start to see this tension where there's, there's a purpose of business. All of these colonies are charters. They are owned by investors back in England. And just like any investor, they want their money back and they want to make a profit. So that's the purpose of all of these colonies. But Massachusetts Bay adds another idea. This idea of a city on a hill, this idea of a shining Christian community that is an example to the rest of the world. And we still see this tension in the United States today. Which are we? Or are we both? Can we be both? Can you both pursue profit and do that in a godly or good way? But at the same time, we're also going to see a great deal of religion. Just persecution. We see this in the form of the Salem witch trials, uh, and people being exiled, like like Roger Williams being exiled out of uh, the Massachusetts Bay and being forced to start his own, own colony in which religious toleration and freedom were practiced. So, what I want to turn our attention to today is the last of the thirteen colonies that gets established, and then I want to fill in this gap, this story, and hopefully get us all the way up to uh, about the American Revolution. All right, so the last, and, and we'll talk about the French in America right now, but I just wanted to use this map. The last of the colonies that's going to be established is Georgia. And Georgia is finally established, let me make sure I get, all the way in 1732. So this is, what, more than 100 years after Jamestown was founded, 120-something years. Uh, that's a long time. And England had had their distractions. They had their civil war. We talked about that last time that distracted them for 40 years from establishing new colonies and, and distracted them from governing the existing colonies. And we're going to see that continue where England has their own problems. And, and I, I like to make this analogy that uh, I might have mentioned this last time, but the colonies are a lot like the children of divorce. Sometimes the parents, in this case, England, are paying attention, right? They've got their stuff together. They're really doting on the child. They're paying a lot of attention. And then something happens and they're distracted with their own problem. And the child kind of has to learn how to make do on their own. And then suddenly mom or dad comes back and starts paying attention again. And it gets weird. That's a lot like what this relationship is between England and the colonies. Never doubt, though, that the colonies saw themselves as British. They acted British. They spoke British. Uh, they, they read British books and magazines, and they would have called themselves English or Irish or whatever it may be. And here, here's the funny thing, okay? I, I kind of love this. Did you guys know that the Southern accent that you hear today was the original British accent? Before the, you know, the Downton Abbey and the, oh, my lords, and all that kind of stuff, okay? The, that really thick southern accent, that was how, how people from England spoke. Kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm going crazy here, but that, that was the original southern, uh, British accent. But over time, especially after the split up between the, the colonies and England, they're going to change that accent over time. And I, I always found that kind of interesting. Okay, so anyway, let's get to Georgia here. Georgia is going to be the last of the 13 colonies that will be established, and it is purposefully established as a military colony to protect the other colonies from Native Americans and from the Spanish. The Spanish continue to control Florida. They will for quite some time. And Native Americans are continually raiding up into colonies like South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and so on. And so in 17... 1832, the British send over a general. His name is James Oglethorpe. James Oglethorpe is a, a rigid military man. If you go to Georgia today, his name is like everywhere, okay? It's just everywhere. And he will establish first the colony of Savannah, the city of Savannah, 
uh, and it will, will, of course, uh, expand out into the colony of Georgia. If you haven't been to Savannah, I highly recommend it. It is a jewel of the South. It's a beautiful city, especially this time of year. It's a great place to visit. Oglethorpe establishes this again as a military colony. And what the British did in Georgia is the same thing that they did in Australia. You might have heard this, where the British just dumped off all of their prisoners and people from their insane asylums and just abandoned them and were like, good luck. That's exactly what they did in Georgia, too, which explains a lot about Georgia, quite honestly, if you've been there. I grew up in Florida and we make fun of Georgia, which really isn't that great, but be that as it may. Um, you know, I do believe that the past plants seeds that grow into the present. One of the really interesting things about Georgia is in their charter, they outlawed slavery. And the funny thing about that is that, and I'm not sure it's really funny, but the ironic thing, I guess, about it is that that lasted a whopping five years before the people of Georgia, the citizens of Georgia, uh, wanted to get involved in the very lucrative slave trade. So they petitioned to have the charter changed. And within just five years, that's exactly what they did. And not only did they make slavery legal, but they made the slave trade legal as well. And Savannah is eventually gonna become one of the larger ports for it. Uh, although Charleston will be a much larger port as far as the South is concerned. So that gives us all the 13 colonies that we really need to look at by 1732. Notice that we're only about, what, 40 years away from the American Revolution already at this point. Uh, so we got a little bit of work to do before we get there. All right, so let's talk about the French. The British have these 13 colonies hugging along the eastern seaboard. And the reality is, while they claim land all the way up to the Appalachian Mountains, and we're going to look more on Thursday at the geography of the colonies, but you have these mountains, and we call them the, the the Smokies here, uh, the Alleghenies, they're called up here, but it's all the same mountain range, all right, the Appalachians. And they run like a spine right about along here. The reality is that almost everybody in the colonies is settled along the seaboard, and they are dependent on the mother country. They're always supposed to be. They're intended to be in uh, dependent upon England. The French were different. Right here, and I know this map doesn't show it very well, but right here, there's what's called the St. Lawrence Seaway. This is a river route that takes you directly from the Atlantic Ocean into the Great Lakes. And this was explored very early on by the French, and the French will st start to establish cities around the Great Lakes. Quebec, Ottawa, the list goes on and on. And this is going to be the center of the French colonies in the Americas. And they never really send over that many people. The, the French have their own series of problems that they're dealing with. We're going to see they're building up to their own re revolution just as much as the United States is. And they're not that interested in, in heavily funding all of this trade. So they don't send over a lot of people. And that means Native Americans and well, the French have to ally with the Native Americans. And that's going to be an important decision. We're going to see in just a little bit, we're going to get to the French and Indian War, and that's going to be an important turning point in the history of North America. So the French claim all of this territory, but they don't occupy it, okay? Um, really, they occupy cities around the Great Lakes. They establish the city of New Orleans, and again, a city that is near and dear to my heart. If you haven't been there, please go and go sometimes other than carnival okay when when you know people are getting crazy the streets are filled with beer and urine and drunk people go some other time it is an absolutely amazing city it has been owned and controlled by the french by the spanish by the english uh the native american heritage the african and african-american heritage all come together in this amazingly beautiful and at sometimes ugly mixture uh, so it's an amazing city to, to examine. Um, so this is often referred to as the Crescent Empire. Oops. That should be a quotation mark at the end. This is what historians tend to refer to because it has kind of that crescent shape. You can almost see like a croissant right there, right? Um, but remember, too, that the French are the minority here. 
And they realized that. And so they made a positive alliance with Native Americans. They worked with them, especially on trade. And by far the most important thing for them at the time was fur. So for Europeans, their choice of what to wear for hundreds, if not thousands of years, was uh, wool or animal pelt. That was pretty much it. Uh, cotton manufacturing isn't really that big. Uh, that's going to come much, much later with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so, so I don't know about you, but I don't wear a lot of wool anything. Uh, it's it's itchy. It's great when it's cold, but it's itchy. It's It, it tends to to get smelly, uh, especially at this time when they're not washing their clothes. Uh, lice and bugs live in it. It's just kind of gross. So along come these beautiful, rich furs, especially beaver. This was incredibly popular. And in fact, we're going to see that this is going to lead to some problems uh, among Native Americans and between Native Americans and the French and the English. The French colonies were weak because of a lack of manpower, a lack of support from the king. The French were not nearly as innovative in setting up these companies as the English were. And, and that's another reason why the Industrial Revolution will eventually, and, and pretty soon here actually, come to England first. That starts about 1750 in England. So we're, we're almost there. So keep that in mind, okay? These, these differing relationships that the English chose to go to war with Native Americans and to try to solve the Indian problem. And we're going to look at ways that they tried to do that. Uh, the French didn't see Native Americans as a problem. They saw them as allies. Who wins in the end? Clearly, the English end up winning. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Speaking of Native Americans. I think this is an important issue that we need to deal with. And we need to realize that for, for Native Americans, especially east of the Mississippi River, the situation was becoming dire. More and more Europeans are starting to flood in. Diseases continue to ravage their populations. And they continue to lose more and more land and power. And this, I think we're much better now at realizing how frustrating and difficult that must have been. But you have to realize that at the time in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, it was a winner take all. You know, when my Buccaneers win the Super Bowl, and I probably shouldn't say that because that's bad luck. But you know what? I'm not going to feel bad for Kansas City. I'm just not. You know, they lost. I hope. You know, they got theirs. They'll be fine. They'll go home, take their giant paychecks, and they'll get a couple of months off. Uh, Somebody remind me, who lost the Super Bowl three years ago? Does anybody even care? Oh, okay. Great. So, do you feel bad for him, Ryan? Heck no! <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I love you, man. Um, yeah, nobody feels bad about the loser. People lose. So why do we feel bad for Native Americans? Why do we feel as though what was done to them was wrong? How is this different than what any other conquering empire in all of history has done? Do we feel bad for the people of Gaul that were defeated by Julius Caesar? What? Why do we feel bad about Native Americans? And, and what we did to them. It's directly related to us, mm. like into our history. And so that's kind of why we, we hit it up or we hit it a lot. And, uh, or it, it was a lot of stuff that was talked about in American history a few decades ago. It, it wasn't the same as what we're learning now. It wasn't the truth. And, and just covered Well, I... I, I I totally agree with that to a point, but I think you're assuming that the history you're being taught now is the truth. And I think probably in 50 years, you'll realize that that's not necessarily the truth. That's not necessarily right. But I completely agree with you, Maggie, and thank you very much. Um, it's, we connect to it. 
we can see the name of these lands. Growing up in Florida, almost everything has a Native American name, uh, like o o Okeechobee and, and Oglala, and the name goes on and on, uh, Sarah, because people who came before us did it, and it's on the land we live on. Yeah, okay, but at, at the same time, I, I think that that's a double standard, that just because it's closer to us, should it matter any differently? Should we judge it any differently? Because it's closer to us geographically and in terms of time. So in other words, if something bad, like if something happens to a people the exact same way that it happened to Native Americans, do we have the right to care less about it or judge it differently? Well, Carly, everybody has disadvantages. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's... They had disadvantages based on the technologies they had available to them, to the animals they had available to them as, as well. The argument I'm trying to make here is that the way we see Native Americans today is not always the way that Americans have looked at it. In the 1970s and 1980s, most Americans couldn't have cared less that, you know, Native Americans got what they deserved. But it's really not been until the contemporary period, the last Last 20 or 30 years, that Americans, especially historians, have started looking at this differently. Probably one of my favorite books of all of this is the book that I think really turned the tide. It's called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Has anybody read this one? It's an amazing story. It's a fantastic book written by a historian, a, a female historian. I can't, I can't think of her name right now, but she's really the one that starts, she also wrote another book that followed this up called A Century of Dishonor, and she switches our perspective to look in a sympathetic way at Native Americans instead of just saying, well, like the patriots, they just weren't good enough. They weren't up to the task, and so they lost, and oh well. Um, instead, it's looking at the way they've been treated, not just when they were defeated, but the continual abuses of Native Americans to this day. They are still the poorest people, excuse me, poorest people in North America. They still have the least amount of land per capita. They also, especially with COVID, have some of the highest disease and death rates in the nation as well. So we have in many ways continued to punish these people for losing 300 years ago. And maybe that's the real problem, is we haven't figured out a way to say, we're sorry, and how to make it right. And maybe that's the exact same problem we have with slavery and its legacy. Maybe we just haven't figured out how to say we're sorry and how to make it right. Maybe that's what we can learn from the past. I don't know. Okay, so I want to look at some of these examples of what is going on in the relationship between Native Americans and especially the English colonists. In 1637, we see the first major outbreak of war, open warfare between Native Americans and English colonists, and this is called the Pequot War. This starts very similarly to what we saw, uh, what we'll see in just a minute with uh, uh, Nathaniel Bacon. This Pequot War start, started with a raid by Native Americans on a plantation on land outside of the Connecticut colony, and in response, the citizens of of the white citizens of Connecticut went out and they hunted down Native Americans. The Pequot tribe doesn't exist anymore because they were hunted to their extermination. And that's different, okay? That's different than just beating somebody. Okay, so let's take our Patriots analogy. That's like if when the Patriots lost the Super Bowl, the winners got to slit their throats on the field of battle and revel in their corpses. That's a little bit much, right? I mean, like, you know, I like to think so. Like, you've taken it way too far there. But that's exactly what the English were trying to do. So this is not just an attempt to defeat your, your enemy, but to exterminate. Maybe that's what really turns us off about this, because this has, this smacks of Hitler's attempts to annihilate the Jewish and, and we have those kind of analogies in the modern age so that we look backwards through that lens, which is a different lens than most people grew up with. Okay. 
maybe I'm beating a, a dead horse at this point. My next uh, major one I want to look at comes in 1675, and this is referred to as King Philip's War. Um, I don't like that name because King Philip was not his real name. His name was Medicom, the whole honor thing. Well, see, Bailey, I think we oftentimes overblow that idea of honor. Uh, we tend to associate that with English, or excuse me, with European knights who didn't actually act very honorable. Um, they were forced to take uh, an oath. It was called the Oath of God. Uh, and this is really for another class. But this was an oath to promise to stop raping women and murdering priests. Now, I usually don't have to get you to take an oath to do things, to not do things like that until you've already done things like that, right? So this idea of honor is, is it's overblown in the literature and it doesn't match the reality of behavior, okay? Uh, and here's the thing, in the face of a savage, as they were for to dishonorable people, do you still have to act in an honorable? That's the question every police officer has to ask themselves every single shift. And some say yes, and some say no. Honor is an idea. Uh, well, <laughs> that's what literature says. What's reality? It's, remember, it's easiest to kick a man when he's down. And oftentimes, it's human nature to take the easy way out. That's just human nature. We have our ideal nature, and then we have reality. And there's tension in between those two. No, okay, anyway, we need to get a little bit back on topic. Um, I don't like this term, King Philip's War, because the guy who was running it, his name wasn't King Philip. The English just gave him that name. Instead, his real name was Medicom. And what Medicom was trying to do is he was trying to unite all of the tribes. This is the first major attempt we see at the tribes trying to come together to unify their response, their pushback against uh, white incursion into their lands. This is also, this King Philip's War was also the first time that we see the English Parliament officially discussing what they called the Indian problem and what to do about it. And they start talking about this idea of reservations, of reserving certain land just for Native Americans. Not land that Europeans want, but let's find other land and, and we'll give that to Native Americans. And this is where they start kicking around that idea. This is the roots of it. We're not going to see the reservation system really come into effect until after the American Civil War. But there, there's some precursors, and we'll come, we'll keep coming back to that idea. Uh, a lot of what I'm doing today is planting ideas that we're going to continue to see grow. One of the other main attempts by Native Americans to unite and come together is what is known as the League of the Iroquois. Now, this actually formed before Europeans arrived, but it was a very loose confederation. And once Europeans start flooding into this land, especially the back country of New England, especially as Pennsylvania is expanding, this League of the Iroquois sought ways to respond. So they had five tribes, and each tribe elected 50 representatives, and they were always oh, men in this case, okay? So 50 men from each of these five tribes, that's 250 men that would all come together in a centralized capital and they would discuss all the important issues of the day, like war and trade and treaties, land boundaries, all of these major issues. In other words, this was their version of Congress. Just like we elect representatives that are supposed to go to a capital and supposed to carry out discussions about these issues, whether they do or not is a, is a discussion for another day, notice the similarities. And in fact, in many ways, Benjamin Franklin is going to be pivotal in this. He was fascinated with the League of the Iroquois, and he actually is one of the ones who, during the, the Constitutional Convention, brings in these ideas. So oftentimes, Many people believe that we took the English model and adopted it and tweaked it for our own purposes. But I would argue that just as much 
much we took from the Native American model and adapted and tweaked it for our own purposes. In many ways, the United States Constitution is a mixture of English government and Native American government. We borrowed very heavily from both of those sources. The League of Iroquois is going to exist all the way up through the French and Indian War that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. The problem is the French and the Indians lost that war, and that's going to lead to the end of the League of Iroquois and to a much of the organized resistance that Native Americans are going to be able to muster uh, against white incursion into their land. What's really interesting is the League of Iroquois Iroquois, this works for 250, almost 300 years. So there was an attempt to do the same thing in the colonies. They attempted to create what's called the New England Confederation. And that was an attempt to get all of the colonies to send representatives to a central meeting place and do the same thing, to start negotiating amongst each other. This failed immediately. The colonists were not united. I cannot make that point clearer. Just like today, we are not a united country. And I'm not really sure that we ever have been. And yet, we have still been able to move forward. So here, in this case, the New England Confederation was an idea that never happened because the colonies couldn't agree on who to negotiate, what the issues were. They just fought amongst themselves. And this should sound really familiar to our politics to this day. So you can look at that. Too. First of all, we're a hopeless people. We can't ever get along. It's awful. We just bicker among ourselves. Or you can look at it the other way and see that despite those different, we have done amazing things as a country. And maybe both of them are correct at the same time. Maybe. All right. So. The big myth of today is the myth of what I like to call the myth of gentility. So if you've ever been to Jamestown or any of these, you know, reenactors, anything like that, they're always, everybody's dressed as nice as you can be. The women have those nice white bonnets on and the guys have a hat with a belt buckle on the front. I have no idea why you put a belt buckle on your hat. I don't know what's up with that fashion thing, right? And everybody bows to each other. My lord, my lady, all of that. They're gentle, right? They're genteel. They're well, well healed. They're clean. They're well behaved. All of that is garbage. It's a lie. You have to realize that this was, and, and if you're not writing down anything, write down this word. This was the frontier. And and this is one of the most important concepts in American life, an idea. What? Just imagine if right now there's no COVID and there's nothing stopping you from going to the other side of the world and starting completely over. Maggie, you don't have to be Maggie. You could be Lourdes Fauntleroy. You can call yourself whatever you want. OK, you can completely reinvent yourself because there's no record saying that you're Maggie here. This was the promise of the Americas that you, you could come to this new world and you could completely start over. It was daring. It was risky. You could lose everything, your life, your fortune, everything. You're putting it all on the line for the opportunity to start over. Now, guys, at, at your age, maybe you want that, maybe you don't, but I promise you at some point in your life where you look at all those skeletons in your closet and you just want to start all over again. And that's exactly the promise of the new world. This is someplace new for you. That frontier is dangerous. It takes incredible will to survive and to succeed, but that's the great promise. But this is more like the Wild West than it is England. And I want to prove that to you right here. This is Nathaniel Bacon. Nathaniel Bacon was a large landholder in Virginia. And the date here is 1675. Again, I don't give you a lot of 
dates, but this is a pretty important one. In 1675, uh, Bacon is a wealthy farmer. He is, I wouldn't call him a plantation owner because we don't really see what we think of, of as plantations yet, okay? But he's a large landowner and he owns quite a few slaves. Um, at one point, Native Americans attack his land and they kill his overseer. Now, when we talk about slavery later on, we'll talk about this term quite a bit. An overseer is the person who is the manager of, of the land. And in many cases, the owner of the land doesn't live on the land. They live in the city. And that's true with Nathaniel Bacon. He lived in Jamestown. And it's kind of like a, a landlord. The landlord doesn't usually live in the apartment complex. They've got a nice house away from the, the, the land that they're renting you, okay? So same case here. Native Americans killed Nathaniel Bacon's overseer. He is furious about this. So he goes to the royal governor in Jamestown. And he demands that the royal governor give him the military. Now, guys, let's say, you know, I, I'm going to pick on Maggie because she's got her camera on. Thank you very much. Maggie, just imagine if you could borrow the Marines destroy your enemies. I mean, just how badass does that feel? You think anybody's going to mess with you now? Like, you remember that one girl back in eighth grade that gave, that insulted you? And just, you know, can you imagine how much you could take that power and use it? Oh, wouldn't that feel good to watch as they stomp her into the... Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> A little overheated there, sorry about that, yeah. But, I mean, seriously, it, this is why we don't allow civilian control of the military. Can you imagine today if Bill Gates could borrow the Marines? Is he going to have any competition that he has to deal with? No! You just blow up your competition and you're done. So the royal governor said no to Nathaniel Bacon. But what I, what I love and hate about this guy is it did instead what nathaniel bacon did was he went to the local store and he bought all of the yeah right yeah uh he bought all of the, the liquor that he could, and he started giving it away for free to all the citizens of jamestown as long as they would listen to his rant and he ranted and he got them hyped up and drunk and drunk and hyped up and guys, this is okay. I, this is why I, I will tell you this: no, nothing good happens after two a.m. Okay, if it's after two a.m. and somebody says, "Hey, you know what we ought to do?" Your answer should always be no, because nothing good is coming after that. Okay, so Nathaniel Bacon gets his people all hyped up and drunk, and then he's like, "Okay." Hey, let's go take care of this Indian problem. And that's exactly what they do. They go out and they massacre every Native American they can find. They, they murder them. They mutilate their bodies. They scalp them. And you know what the really tragic part about this is? The Native Americans he's attacking aren't even the same tribe that killed his overseer. But it really didn't matter, did it? Because one Indian is the same as another Indian. And the word for that is racism. Nathaniel Bacon and his mob will mass murder Native Americans. And then, oh, that's not even good enough. Then they return and march back on Jamestown and burn it to the ground. That's why I said before, if you've been to Jamestown, it's not the same Jamestown as there was originally. It's been rebuilt and remanufactured. Instead, it's it's an American citizen. Well, not really, but it's a British citizen of Jamestown that burns it to the ground. Well, after all that, um, the mob kind of break. The royal governor is able to reassert his authority. He uses the military. He declares martial law, and he starts hunting down these people. Uh, uh, Nathaniel Bacon actually dies of a fever, so he can't be held liable. But 23 citizens of Jamestown will be found guilty and hung, and their 
bodies are left to rot in the streets as an example of what happens to people who defy the authority of the crown. Does that sound gentle? Does that sound like the picture that we have in our head of what these colonists look like with their bows and their white wigs and their maladies? It was crazy. We know from studies today that the colonists drank on average seven times more than the average American drinks today. The average colonist drank 24 gallons of liquor a year. Gallons. That's two gallons of liquor a, year, a month. That's a lot of alcohol, okay? And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But I just want to continue to kind of hammer away at this point that this was not a genteel place. But I encourage you to look up something. Declaration of the People. This was Nathaniel Bacon's one written proclamation related to what we call Bacon's Rebellion today. And I tell you, if you read that, try to hear Bernie Sanders' voice saying it, because it sounds exactly what Bernie would sound like today. Kind of eerie how history repeats itself in weird ways. Another great example of the chaos going on in the colonies is the Salem Witch Trials. Again, give you a date here, 1692. <laughs> okay, these birdie memes are absolutely slaughtering me. You just kill me with this stuff. So <laughs> I tell you, you know, I you know what I really love is that he turned it into a T-shirt, sold them for a profit, and then gave gave all the money to provide meals to struggling people in his home state. That. That is why I love Bernie, because, yeah, it's always about his people. That's I got to respect that. OK, in 1692, four teenage girls in the colony of Salem, Massachusetts, claimed that they were in league with the that they had been temporarily possessed by the devil at times and that the devil had made them and others do awful things. The one character that really doesn't usually get enough attention in this was the the African slave. Actually, she was a Caribbean African. Her name is Tituba, and she's the one who is seen as introducing them to probably what we today would call voodoo or, or voodoo, uh, one of these devil worships. You got to realize that this is in the heart of the wars of religion. While Europe is tearing itself apart, Protestants are murdering Catholics and different Protestants are murdering different pro Protestants. It's just chaotic. Again, the colonies are directly connected to the home country. So the chaos going on in England is the chaos that's going on in the colonies. And here in 1692, this rapidly got out of control. These teenage girls start accusing more and more people throughout the colony, and even people outside of the colony. In one case, a man who hadn't lived in Salem for 40 years was arrested, brought back to Salem, tried, and executed. More than 200 people were put on trial. And, and the, these trials, they were overseen by a man named Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was the leading religious figure in the colonies at the He was the leading preacher, uh, publisher. A lot of the publishing going on was sermons. They were very, very popular, and Cotton Mather's were very popular. There are still, you, you can read Cotton Mather's sermons to this day. Cotton Mather made a very important decision when he first came, and he he decided to accept what is called spectral evidence. Now hear this, okay? So let's say I'm, I'm headed to bed one night and I, I start to hear a voice in my head that says that Ryan Hawks is possessed by the devil. He's a terrible person and he's gonna ruin the world and I need to kill him. Am I justified in hunting Ryan down and killing him? Right. 
Ryan, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Gabriel, you're, you're scaring me, man, and I, I respect that. All right. We need that this early in the morning. Obviously. Absolutely not. Okay. This is so ridiculous. Okay. And yet Cotton Mather is going to take, make this decision to allow spectral evidence. And that way these girls will testify and they say, well, I heard the devil whisper in my ear that that one, she, she's a witch. And that's enough to get these women, almost all of them women, arrested and then tortured. Religious torture to see if they are or are not witches. And here's the problem with this, okay, is that there really is a logic to this. Okay. And here's where I have to get into a little bit of, of Christian ideology. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, having been brought up in this tradition, I think I'm right, but we'll see. Okay. One of the core ideas of Christianity is that there is a covenant between God and and those who choose to follow, that you could almost call this a contract, right? In exchange for, for your belief and your faith and your service to God, you are rewarded with eternal life. You can't have one without the other, okay? okay? If you don't believe in God and ask for his salvation and try to atone for your sins, you do not get salvation, okay? Okay. So this is a positive contract, you could say. If, if I do this, you, you will give me something in return. Well, the devil is often portrayed as the opposite of God. And so if you can have a positive contract with God, then you could also create a negative contract. Uh, probably the classic example of this is Robert Johnson, the man who's given and credit for creating the blues and rock and roll. The idea is that he went down to the crossroads and he traded his soul to learn how to play that guitar. If you've seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's what you see depicted there. Notice that God does not promise his followers anything in this world. And this is where I have problems with people like Joel Osteen and others who promise this prosperity gospel, that if you accept Christ, then he's going to make you rich and famous and powerful. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And in fact, my reading of the Bible sees the exact opposite, okay? In fact, that's the promise that the devil gives to his followers, is that he will give them what they want in this lifetime in exchange for their soul for all time. Brian, am, am I getting this at all right I have to agree with you with that because, you know, it, it's, it just seems like these these preachers nowadays, they're all about money, money, money. If you send in money, you'll get more back than what you send in. And, and it's it's kind of construed, it, it, it's flipped it on its head what the truth is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a disturbing tendency because it seems like now you're actually making the promise that the devil made to his followers in the name of God. And there's a problem there, clearly. Okay, so what that means, let's apply that here, okay? So the devil has promised you protection in this life. And that's why when these women were tortured, they wouldn't die. So they would tie these women to chairs and try to drown them. And if they didn't die, that was proof that they were in league with the devil. You see that? Can you see the logic there? So we'll torture you, but if you won't die, okay, in the name of God, I'm going to hurt you and try to kill you to prove whether you're in league with the devil. There are so many problems with that. Now, <laughs> Gabriel, you're killing me. So, okay, let me ask you this. Then why did they burn witches? Why did that work? Because people became so paranoid with who was it, they didn't know who was who, so they couldn't really distinguish between who was in league with God, who was in league with the devil. Mm. Uh, uh, not quite. And, and Carly, I, I would really caution you from, from writing this off as mass hysteria, because there is a logic to it. And here's the thing, we, we, it's easy to write off people as crazy or hysterical, but you have to realize that every single person in the history of the world, whether sane or not, believes that what they are doing is right. Hitler believed that he was 
is right. Stalin, Mao, everybody believes that what they are doing is logical and right. The people who charged the Capitol January 6th believed that what they were doing was right. Sometimes revenge was being used, and, and we can talk about that in a second, but think about the logic of this. Okay, where does the devil come from? Where does he live? Hell. What is the distinguishing feature of hell? Hellfire and brimstone. That is Satan's weakness, and therefore he cannot protect his followers from that. And that is why fire works to kill witches. Do you see the logic? So did they. And that may be the scariest thing about studying history, because really, again, we're studying human nature. And until you embrace the fact that the people that think differently than you are still thinking, logical, intelligent beings, you cannot understand them. When you write off the opposition as crazy, you have done a disservice to yourself. And therefore, we can never, ever communicate, can we? When you think the other person is crazy, are you even going to try to effectively communicate with them? Maybe this is the problem we have today. So we think the other side's just plain nuts. Frank, you're absolutely right. Later studies will prove that uh, what happened here is Salem was growing very quickly, and they actually were starting to split into two churches. And what this meant was because every citizen paid taxes to the church, this would have doubled their taxes. And we know that most of the people that were executed were the people who split off and went to the new church. It's members of the old original church that were using, that were persecuting those who split off into the new church. Almost everybody who died was one of the, was a member of the new flock. So yeah, they use this as revenge. All of this just, we tend to look at this as the exception to the rule. I would argue to flip that script and look at it as though this was an example of the rule. We cannot think of Bacon's Rebellion and of Salem Witch Trials as outliers. This was normal. These are not the only examples of witchcraft trials in the New World. They're just the most famous. In this case, 20 citizens of Salem will be executed. Almost all of them women who were burned or hung. In a few cases, men, they carried out what was called pressing, which is particularly nasty. That's where you lay a man on the ground and you put success possibly heavier weights and rocks on his chest until eventually it caves in your rib cage and you can't take your next breath. We did this to people that we had lived with, people that we had worshipped with, people that we had sat with in pews, held hands, and praised the same God with. This is what we are capable. This is what Shakespeare called man's inhumanity to man. And it may be the most vile part of who we are, but it's part of who we are, and we have to recognize that so that we can stop it. We have to look at it to recognize it, to understand it, so we don't repeat it. That might be my best lesson from this entire class. Don't forget, the people you, you see as Adam see themselves as parents, lovers, friends, and humans, just like you do. Do not write off your, your enemies as fools and as crazy. That is the greatest disservice you can do to yourself and to them. Well, in all of this crazy, we see what is probably one of the most amazing religious movements in the new world. And this becomes known as the Great Awakening. Now, now, this starts in the 1730s, but this is this becomes eventually known as the first Great Awakening because eventually we will have a second Great Awakening. Now, what's really interesting to me is we have this Great Awakening right before the American Revolution. We will have the second Great Awakening right before the Civil War. Are they connected? Absolutely, just as everything else in history is. This first Great Awakening is really brought on by 
American colonists starting to be very concerned about the direction their country was taking. Now, now think about this. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been to a tent revival? Has anybody ever, ever been to one of these things? Oh, I mean, they are incredibly moving. You have people that are bearing witness before you. You have an entire crowd that that if you want to talk about a kind of mass hysteria, you, 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 I wouldn't call it a hysteria, but they certainly feed off of each other. And this starts to get really hyped over time. But just compare that with your usual church service where you come in, it's all stayed, everybody's dressed nice, ladies got the nice hat on, and you sing a couple of hymns, half the audience falls asleep during the sermon, you give some money in the plate, you shake some hands and then you go home or you go back to Denny's and you start cursing and hitting your kids by 1230. I mean, you know, I, that sounds terrible, but which would you rather have that stayed old same thing or this ecstatic direct experience of God? There, there are places in this world that I've stood in the Vatican uh, St. Peter's, Notre Dame, where when those lights shine through those windows, you are in the presence of God. He is there. She is there. And you are part and parcel of her. That's what we all want. That's what we want out of our religious experiences, is we want to feel a part of God, part of a community. And that's what the First Great Awakening gave to their people. These are outdoor tent revivals, unlike anything the world had ever seen. And this is, uh, especially the big guys in this, was a guy named George Whitfield, an amazing preacher. And, and he is really the one that, that takes what today we call hellfire and brimstone, uh, that kind of preaching. Uh, his most famous sermon was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry. This is a vindictive, powerful God that demands from you respect and obedience. And in exchange, he will give you eternal life. But if you will not give him that, he will damn you to eternal suffering. Powerful messages. Now, now uh, another one, Jonathan Edwards. Whoops. I believe it was Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just I wanted to make that correction. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Um, both of these men, this, this hellfire brimstone approach, these men would travel. They were traveling preachers. Instead of establishing individual ministries, they traveled, especially in the back country. Let me go back to my one of my maps here. Uh, there. They especially traveled in the back country. Uh, the upcountry of uh, New England, especially New York and Pennsylvania, this will eventually, because so much hellfire and brimstone is being preached over there, this becomes known as the burned over district. And many of these preachers are going to come from England, and many local preachers are going to be inspired as well to leave their flocks behind and instead to become traveling ministers, not just to the different colonies, but to Native Americans as well. This is also where we're going to see the, the problem with this is that when a preacher feels called to go out on the road and to become a minister, uh, uh, not to an individual flock, what does he leave behind? You don't leave behind another minister. Instead, you leave behind what is called a lay person. This is someone who is probably steeped in the Bible, but has no formal training. And so, unfortunately, out of this, we are actually going to see Christianity in the Americas divide into many different sects and denominations. Today, my favorite example that comes out of this are the snake charmers. And, and you see this quite a bit in the South. And they have taken a single verse of the Bible. And I can't remember. I'd have to look it up. Ryan could probably tell me. Uh, in which it claims, if your faith is strong enough, when the snake bites you, it poisons its poison will not kill you. They took that single verse and they made an entire religion out of it. Here's the problem. If a snake bites you, it doesn't really matter how strong your faith is. If it's poisonous and you don't get to a hospital, you're going to die. I don't think God gave us the option. Well, God gave us all the options, but I don't think God's telling you to do what's 
stupid. Okay. Uh, it, it's the same with Christian science. Many people believe that you know you can just pray away disease. Um, maybe so. Maybe not. I would like it if that were true. But we also have science that can cure that disease as well. This is going to end up with a more, more broad religiosity in the United in the colonies. More people will be practicing. More people will be practicing their faith openly and loudly. And we do get out of this an increase in religious toleration as well. In some cases, some toleration for some pretty wackadoodle ideas, but more religious toleration is going to come out of this and a greater religiosity, a rededication of the colonies to that old Massachusetts Bay idea of the kingdom on the hill, that city on the hill. Instead of the Jamestown idea of money, 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 instead, it's a reaffirmation that we too, we have another purpose as well beyond that. Oh. Okay, just one more thing I want to cover today, and then I'm going to let you go. And this is what is known here in the colonies as the French and Indian War. Now, around the world, this is known as the Seven Years' War. There's a little problem. Uh, I'm going to give you the years and see if you guys can help me with what the problem is here. So this war takes place from 1753 to 1764. What's the problem with the name? That's 11 years. Uh, yeah. So are historians just bad at math? The answer is yes. Okay. The 100 years war lasted 127 years. But you know what? If I told you, seriously, if I called it the 127 years war, war, you'd think I was a jackass, okay? So, you know, we round, right? But how do you round from 11 to 7? I don't know. I just don't know, okay? So here in the colonies, it's called the French and Indian War. And this is really, we had seen a series of European wars during the 18th century, 17th and 18th century. I want to mention just a couple of these, just to give you an idea of how warlike the Europeans were. Oftentimes, it's the Native Americans that are presented as the warlike people, but it's really Europeans who are almost constantly at war with each other. Okay, so this starts with the War of the League of Augsburg. Ooh la la, I think you have to have your pinky up when you say that. You don't need to know that, but just another example. Uh, then, then comes Queen Anne's War after that. Then the War of Spanish Succession. And by far the most important of these for our case is the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War. So this is the war in which the colonists are fighting alongside the professional British army. Combined together, those two forces, we're going to call the colonies a militia, okay? because that's what they were. Now, if you know your Second Amendment, it talks about a well-regulated militia. That's because in the colonies, you didn't have a professional standing army, okay? People who just do the army, that's all they do. That didn't exist in the colonies, okay? If it did, these were British soldiers. Instead, a militia is kind of like the National Guard, okay? You show up, you show up on the weekends, you shoot some guns, you drink a whole lot, and then you go home, okay? It's kind of what these militias work. So just picture this. You've got the best trained, best experienced army in the world, the British army at this time, along, alongside a bunch of militia members. And they're combined going to fight against the French and the Native Americans, the French and Indian. This begins actually way out here. Let's see if I can find it right there on the frontier of Pennsylvania at a place called Fort Duquesne. It's Duquesne is how it's spelled, D-U-Q-U-E-S-N-E, -E, but it's pronounced Duquesne. This is actually the first military fight that George Washington was ever involved in, and he was a commander of the militia. Um, this actually sits today, if anybody's a Pittsburgh fan, go Steelers. Um, this is actually where Three Rivers Stadium sits today. Literally, that's where Fort Duquesne was, is where Three Rivers Stadium is today. So, you know, if you've ever watched a, a Steelers game, you see literally three rivers come together. 
there's the stadium. That's where this fort was. Um, to say that the militia performed poorly is giving them a lot more credit than they deserve. Uh, um, Washington's men were poorly supplied, very poorly led. Let me let me give you a stat here. In every military engagement that George Washington ever led, he was two for 17. He won just two of the battles he ever led in his life out of 17. Now today, if we had a military leader who lost 15 out of 17 battles, would they still have a job? If you're a prof professional athlete and you're two for 17, you're, you're going back to the minors really soon, aren't you? No, nobody's going to hire you. No, you're gonna, if you shoot two for 17, boy, did your arm get broken? What is wrong with you? And yet we still see him as a hero and a great military leader. Who would pick them up, though, Ryan? Like you're two for seven. How do you sell that to somebody else? And, and I don't think that, oh, wow. Oh, the truth of that is deeply impressive. Wow. But who the hell are we going to trade Washington to? The British don't want him. So here at Duquesne, Washington leads these ragtag men. They're drunk. Uh, they don't have good weapons. They don't have the same weapons. This should sound kind of similar to what the South looked like at the beginning of the Civil War. It's chaotic. And it was terrible. The British had to save his ass. This happened repeatedly throughout the French and Indian War. The British would operate well against the Native Americans and against the French forces. And the militia were kind of there as the drunken idiots to screw it all up. Can you see how now we're starting to, instead of everybody is British, now you start having the British and the colonists, two different people. The British start to make fun of the colonists. They make up terms for them. This should sound familiar. They call them hicks. Yokels, my favorite. Tar Heels, sound familiar? That is not a term of respect. That means your ass is so poor that instead of shoes, you literally walk in tar and use that for your shoes. You're so poor, your mama couldn't buy you a shoe. Now, can you see how this is starting to create a divide? And we're starting to create a uniquely American identity separate from the British. Yes, we're still on the same side, but now the British see themselves, we're the professionals, we're the upper crust, and you're a bunch of hicks and yokels. Just shut up, do your job, provide the raw materials we need to get rich, and do what you're told. If I taught you like that, would we have any kind of a positive relationship? Just shut up, do your work, and, and I don't want to hear your question. It's just shut up. That's, we're not in it together anymore, are we? Now it's you're here to do what I tell you to do. And you've had bosses like this, haven't you? And you've had, I hope, bosses that are in it to help, that will do the work better than you do because they're getting paid. more. They should be able to do your job better than you do it because they're making more money to do it, right? Now we start to see this divide. And notice that when this revolution, this, this war ends in 1763, we are just 10 years from the American Revolution. Sarah, what do you mean wrong? What do you mean? Okay. Um, eventually, out of this, it, by 1763, the French and the Indian resistance is going to collapse, and they sign what is called the Treaty of Paris. Now, there are actually quite a few treaties of Paris. This is one of the first ones. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. But it's also what happens sometimes, and it actually, sadly, often gets rewarded. 
Okay, so this French and Indian War changes everything. Okay, I want you to look at this. So from these 13 colonies just hugging along, along the eastern seaboard, look what England gets out of this Treaty of Paris. Blam. They suddenly get all the territory east of the Mississippi and almost all of Canada. Guys, this land they gain in that treaty is 18 times bigger than England itself. And now England is a global superpower. On top of all this land in North America, they also gain control of the entire continent of India, the subcontinent. They gain land all over the globe, and England is now a global superpower for the first time in history. Look at the sacrifices they had made to create that empire. Hundreds of years of warfare, all those wars I mentioned before, culminating in this great victory, incredible sacrifices of men and material and money, and England was deeply in debt. We're going to look at how that's going to play into to and lead to the American Revolution. But look at what they do. Look at this. You see that Indian Reserve? All the land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River is promised to Native Americans, and here's what it says in the treaty, for all time. How does that work out? Not so great. But put yourself in the shoes of the colonists who had fought on this land. They had fought, they had sacrificed, and, and they believed that they were going to share in all of, of this new bounty. But instead, immediately England says, nope, you cannot spread beyond the Appalachian Mountains where you already are. So, so so if I tell you, okay, you're, I need you to work five extra shifts this week, and I need you to work double the shifts too, but I'm not going to pay you anything for that. What if I don't tell you about that until after you've worked the shifts? Oh, thanks for all that extra work, but you're not going to get any extra money for that. Would you be a little upset about that? Can you see how the colonists are going to be upset about this? They believe that they would be able to spread out into that land. They had fought for it. They had died for it. Their children had died for this. It didn't matter if they fought well or not. They had made those sacrifices, and now they wanted the rewards, and England wouldn't give it to them. And now we're seeing that divide, aren't we? Here we have the British, and here we have the colonists. They're no longer the same people. Now they're being seen as yokels and tar heels, and they're not getting the just rewards for what they've earned. And you know the bitterness, and you know that bitterness grows. It doesn't just go anywhere. As humans, we have a horrible inca incapacity to forgive others and to for forgive ourselves. This is not going to go anywhere. And in fact, guys, we're just 12 years from open warfare between England and, it, and the colonies. And that really starts here. I wish the French and Indian War were taught more. I would argue this is probably, other than the American Revolution, the most important war in early American history. It sets the tone, it sets the standard, and it really creates that divide between the colonies and the mother country. And that's not gonna go anywhere. And in fact, we're gonna see revolutionaries like Samuel Adams and Ben Franklin and others continue to stoke that fire and to talk about now independence. And that's a word we're gonna to turn to next week. What we're gonna do next time is we're gonna focus in on the geography of the colonies. And we're gonna talk about how geography has this determining effect. For example, you don't see a lot of farmers on top of mountains, do you? And so we're going to look at how the geography of the different colonies is going to impact their development and lead to some regional developments and some regional differences, especially between the North and the South. We'll turn our attention there next time. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your participation, for, for just being awesome. I love seeing you guys. I thank you.
Thank you for coming. Make sure if you haven't gotten that last homework in, get it in before Thursday. That's the deadline. And then you have your next one due on Thursday. See how if you don't get this done, this starts stacking. It just keeps getting worse. Take the time, get the work done, get it in. If you have any questions or you need anything, I'm always here. Thank you very much. Love you guys. Be good to yourselves and others. And I'll see you Thursday. Bye. Thank you, Sarah.